The Bible tells us that the word of God is not merely letters in a page. It actually says the word of God is living and active. It's spiritual. It's alive. And even though it goes online like this or wherever you find yourself in, if you meditate on that word day and night, it will work for you. The Bible actually says, do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. In other words, keep confessing it. Meditate on it day and night. And then it says, so that you may be careful to obey and do everything that you find in it. It says further that if you do that, whatsoever you do, you will find you will be successful and you will prosper. I want to talk to you this morning about the Word of God and uh, some of the things that you can meditate on. Before I do that, this is a picture of what my wife sent me on Friday, Valentine's Day. In order to have some respite of uh, fun in the midst of the crisis, and she knew that being the pastor of the church, I need to, I've got a lot of things I had to attend to in light of the service and the developments that were unfolding. And she sent me this Valentine's card, and you can see there's a, a mask, and there's a, there's a disinfectant, and there's, there's these uh, toilet paper. And then at mid-morning, or sometime probably closer to noon, she sent me this other one. And, and all of this is in light of, she was trying to make fun of our day knowing that we're not going to have a Valentine celebration now having been married 37 years going 38 this year which was a typical thing that we did together as husband and wife at the center of all this is the virus the coronavirus which you now have a name COVID-19 which is really what this is why we're doing all the things we're doing and the question we need to ask ourselves in light of the word of God is what is God doing when things like these happen, or for that matter, even if they're not the necessarily crisis moments, you need to ask yourself, what is God doing? We find verses in the book of Hebrews chapter 12, verse 26, where it says, at that time, God shook the earth. But now, and if you're there, take, take, take stock of this word now. It says, now he has promised. Now, the previous line was talking about a moment when God shook the heavens and the earth in the Old Testament. But now the, this verse is saying now, and that means now and forever now, he has promised. I've always referred to this verse as the promise no one wants. Everybody likes the promise of success and prosperity, of blessing, but this one about this promise is something a little bit different. The promise is once more I will shake not only the earth but also the heavens. This is the promise of God. This is one of the promises. Of the 6,000 promises of the Bible, here's one of them. Earlier this year, the Filipinos received the greatest firecracker of them all. There was a volcanic eruption in the Philippines. That's a shaking. The, earlier than that, the Australians had a fire scare all over Australia. In fact, it's just now beginning to normalize. The point is, this promise still holds. God will shake. That's a promise. Now, he explains in the next verse why he's doing that. It's not because he's just mad or he's trying to, or, or trying to make hard, life hard for us. He says, the words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken. What he's trying to do when shaking happens is he's shaking you so you could understand and realize what are the things in your life that can be shaken. And the purpose of that, that is created things so that what cannot be shaken may remain. The goal of the shaking is not to make life hard or to sh just necessarily shake you, but to get you to the place of becoming stable because the things that can be shaken have been removed and the only thing that remains is that which cannot be shaken. In short, if this is what God is doing, he's trying to stabilize us in the midst of this crisis, not just the coronavirus crisis, but the other crisis that other people find themselves in, how should you respond? In thinking about this and meditating over this message, I couldn't help but think about these plagues and the plagues that Moses and the Israelites faced in Egypt. It was an amazing moment. There were 10 plagues. And in those plagues, uh, they were just as real and that's what this is, as dangerous. And yet in the midst of that, we see this verse in the book of Exodus chapter 8, verse 23. I will make a distinction between my people and your people. He's speaking about, and please don't hear me wrong here. I hope you're not hearing the wrong thing. I'm not saying that all of these virus things are from God. What I'm saying is they're real. What I'm saying is they're dangerous. And what I'm saying is in the midst of this, you could be a people that believe that God will hold you distinctly. 
What's interesting about this story is after this happens, the Israelites essentially become free of slavery. And they get out of Egypt and they move into what is known as the promised land. At the borders of the promised land, there they are in history, a junction when God's promise to bring them to the place of rest, they arrive at there. Moses, instead of just nonchalantly walking, by the way, there's nothing wrong with doing an online service. That doesn't mean you have less faith. There was a moment in the book of Exodus where they were told, bring your cattle and your livestock indoors because I'm about to do something that's going to kill everything. In fact, you stay indoors. And those who obeyed got themselves free. There's nothing, there's no, that doesn't mean that when you do that, you don't have faith. Part of faith is being wise and being able to hear the voice of God in the midst of a crisis. Now, here's what happens. They arrive at the promised land, and we pick up our story in Numbers chapter 13, verse 17. Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan. That's wise. He wanted to know, given this opportunity that God has for us, we're now people who've been free from slavery. We're now entering the greatest opportunity of our lives to live in the promised land rather than in a land of slavery. He decides to send spies ahead. Now, the Bible says at the end of 40 days, they return from spying out the land. These spies come back, and further in verse 26, the first part of verse 26, it says, they came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole assembly of the Israelite community in Kadesh in the desert of Paran. So now they're, they're, they're back from spying the land, and they reported to them to the whole assembly. They reported this idea of what they saw or literally what they saw in the promised land and showed them not just the, what they saw, they showed them proof of the magnitude of the opportunity that God had set them up for. Now notice in the very next verse it says, they gave Moses this account. We went into the land which you sent us and it does flow with milk and honey. The very promises of God, the thing that God assured us is actually there and it's real. In fact, here is the fruit. Now in verse, the next verse in verse 28, but the people who live there are more powerful. All of a sudden, they, they're saying now they're, they're, there's a problem. As real as that is, there are people there who are powerful. The cities are fortified and they're very large. And we even saw giants. Here's the point. Point number one, great opportunities come with great obstacles. If you're going to see great opportunities, it's probably wrapped in great obstacles. And you need to understand that in the midst of what's happening to us, the world, there are opportunities because there are great obstacles. Now notice further in verse 29, they begin to give other reasons why this is not possible, that this opportunity, as great as it is, is riddled with so much obstacles, so many obstacles rather. The Amalekites, which were descendants of Esau, they're kind of half related and they're, they're problems. The, the, the Hittites, these guys that have an established empire in the land, that's a problem. The Jebusites and the Amorites and the Canaanites, and you can think of a lot of other reasons why the great opportunities we miss because of the great obstacles we face. In pondering this current crisis and asking the Lord in prayer, what are the opportunities that you can learn in the midst of this crisis? First one I could think of was to learn that God is bigger than the biggest obstacle. Think about that. Without an obstacle, you will never realize how to magnify who God is and not minimize, but really understand the difference and the disparity between a current problem which you've been in before. And every time you learn that, you gain a greater opportunity to earn massive levels of faith, to believe that God is bigger than your biggest obstacle. As I was pondering through this, I could think of a number, and you, I'm sure you could think of a number if you realized and took away your focus from the current problem and started looking at the possible opportunities. Another opportunity I thought of was people will be more open to God because they're now realizing that there is just some things you can't fix with money, with your abilities, with your strength, with your career, or whatever else you have. Another opportunity I thought of was to bring the church outside of its walls. We can actually now share this video to other people and let them see there are other options in the spiritual realm that pertain to God. 
the ability to, to improve our services as church. I, I'm so excited to let you know that our kids' church is going online, and I'm thankful for Pastor Kern Lee who spearheaded our team and said, we're going we're gonna to make it as if they're in live church, and, and they can now invite their neighbors, and they can now uh, go together as a small group and still fellowship in homes and in different places in the midst of the current crisis. When you think about these opportunities, the ability to improve our services or the greater opportunity to reach out to and serve neighbors and friends. Recently, my wife received her online delivery of toilet paper. As many of you know, if you're living in Singapore, that there was a moment here when they ran out of toilet paper. And my wife had ordered online and it arrived and then, then she had a few rolls that were extra and then she wrote this note and it says, hi neighbors, just sharing uh, some, of, uh, some, some love today. I know this is, she basically wrote our neighbor and said, here's some toilet paper and left it at the door. These are people that we have never come across with just because of the busyness of life. And all of a sudden now there's an opportunity. Great opportunities come when there are great obstacles. And I want to encourage you as you fellowship with others to think about these possibilities. Not just what I've mentioned here, I'm sure if you dig down deep, you have more personal, more real, more tangible opportunities that you can find. Not only that, there's a greater desire to pray consistently. Without a crisis, without an obstacle, people take God for granted. And it's the funny thing about humans is that we don't realize how often we take the things that are invisible for granted. We take time for granted because that's invisible. We take electricity for granted. Without electricity, we won't all be here. We take gravity for granted, but we all know you can't just walk out of a window and of your HDB. We, we take a lot of things. We, we take air for granted. Those are invisible. But the Bible tells us to pray without ceasing because God is like air. God is like gravity. We cannot just deny him his presence. The best way to do that is to acknowledge him and to pray without ceasing, almost like breathing. This is a great opportunity for us to desire to pray more consistently wherever we find ourselves. The point is, great opportunities come with great obstacles. The second point, as I was pondering this story of the Israelites in Egypt and out of Egypt into the promised land, the 10 spies, and the second point I want to make is great opportunities do not come with manuals. When you think about the greatest opportunities, if there was a manual that existed for those opportunities, then there's no need for those opportunities to be great because they won't be great. Great opportunities come without manuals because they're for, on the onset. In other words, that's, why, that's precisely why they're great opportunities. Now notice in Numbers chapter 13, verse 17, Moses sent them to explore the land of Canaan. He said, go through the Negev and on into the hill country. That's the first thing you need to understand. If, you're, if you don't have a manual, the first thing you've got to understand, this is the reason why you cannot have fear, but you have to have faith, is because the only way you can write a new manual is you have to be on the ground yourself. I was scheduled to fly out to London tomorrow to be with our Every Nation London Church in our discipleship conference there. But as this thing unfolded, I decided I cannot leave. This is an opportunity to write a manual. And this is a, the only way you can do that is to be on the ground. There's no way this is going to happen without you being on the ground. Now, notice in verse 18 of the same chapter, see what the land is like and whether the people who live there are strong or weak or few or many. The point in saying that is that you've got to see what this land looks like. You've got to see the people. In other words, you have to see things as they are. And you're not going to do that if you're not on the ground. This is how you write a new manual. You, you are on the ground, you see things. In other words, you're factual. You're not denying the truth. You're not, deny, you're not minimizing the reality of trouble and danger. In fact, that's faith. Faith is not blindly saying there's no problem. Faith is actually acknowledging there's a problem, but God will give me wisdom. God will give me prudence. God will give me power. God will heal me. But I have to see things as they are. Now, thirdly, in verse 19, it says, Moses said, ask these questions. What kind of land do they live in? Is it good or bad? What kind of towns do they live in? Are they walled or fortified? In short, 
if you're going to write a manual for the great opportunities that God has for you, ask the right questions, if not the hard ones. Too many times as Christian believers, we don't ask the right questions or we don't even want to ask the hard ones. Well, God is able to answer any of our questions regardless of how hard they are and whatever they are. The key is to ask the right questions. Are the walls fortified? That's a hard question because if they are, then we need to believe God by faith that in the midst of this obstacle, God can make a way. Now, further in verse 20, 20 rather, it says, do, you, do, do your best to bring back some of the fruit of the land. And if the season, and check if the season is ripe for grapes. And as I pondered through this verse, I couldn't only think of one thought and use your common sense. In other words, if it's not in season, then you're not going to find it there. If it's not the time to do it, if you, don't, if, you, if you don't bring it back, it won't be here. There's a place where we've got to understand, we've got to be in the ground. We've got to see things as they are, and we've got to be in faith, and we've got to, we've got to believe God that, that He is moving for us and not against us. We're going to have to do that. We're going to have to ask the hard questions and the real questions and trust the Holy Spirit to give us the right answers. But there's a moment when you're going to have to use your common sense. God gave you common sense for a reason. He made it common because it's important that you do it properly. In other words, great opportunities come without a manual. Great opportunities come with great obstacles. Great opportunities come without a manual. My last and final point as we ponder through God's Word, as we spend time together in worship, is great opportunities come to those who stay the course. Great opportunities will not always be there. There's a verse in the Gospels where Jesus says, there's a day when the night is coming and no one can work. In this particular story, we find that some of the Jews miss out on this great opportunity because they didn't stay the course. The course is, no matter what's happening, believe that what God promised you is going to happen. He did promise that there will be shaking, but he also has 5,000 other promises that he's going to bless you. And if you stay the course and you keep believing God, if you pray, if you meditate on that word day and night, you will find yourself in that place of receiving the great opportunities that God has for you. Now, the story unfolds in Numbers chapter 14. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, how long will this wicked community grumble against me? Basically, God's a bit ticked off here. I've heard these complaints, and you know, it's funny how we always think God is ticked off with people who don't believe him. These are people who believe him. In fact, God, God is usually ticked off with people who have actually seen him deliver so many things. Why can you not trust me over this next obstacle that is really behind that obstacle is a great opportunity for you? And he says, they keep grumbling against me. I don't know why. I mean, I've delivered them over 10 plagues. I brought them out of slavery. I, uh, why can't they even believe me again? I've heard their complaints and grumbling. And, and be, be careful about this. God doesn't like grumblers. And maybe sometimes we don't say it. And I'll be just be honest with you. I find myself there. And that's the good part about God is our God is we can repent and say, Lord, I'm sorry for grumbling. And I'm sorry for not believing. And I'm sorry for for really, for not trusting you. And he was saying to them, uh, so, so tell them. And this is what God's saying to Moses and Aaron. As surely as I live, declares the Lord, I will do the very thing I heard you say. If that's what you believe, it's not even because I'm judging you. I'm just doing what's right and fair because you believe that anyway. And so that's the, that's the tough part where we keep blaming God about our issues. We're really in our hearts. That's what we believe. And in this wilderness, he says, your bodies will fall. Every one of the 20-year-olds and more who counted it in the census and who, was, who grumbled against me, and it's not, that's not an unfair deal. That wasn't God judging them. He had delivered them he, from plagues. He had brought them out of the promised land. He literally split the Red Sea, brought them right there, and showed them the reality of the opportunities that were presented to them they would just believe him and trust him. But they wouldn't. Instead, they grumbled against him. Now notice further in verse 30, 
Not one of you will enter the land. I swore with an uplifted hand to make your home, except Caleb, son of Jepune, and the son of Joshua, and Joshua, son of Nun. Now, if you've ever heard the term, the 80-20 principle, this is not very far from this. Ten, two out of 12, or, or the 10 spies who didn't make it, and you have the two that made it. God can settle for less. What he's after is our hearts. Great opportunities come to those who stay the course. Regardless of what you're facing, regardless of how big the obstacle is, God is able to deliver you, and God will deliver you. In thinking about how to illustrate this and praying through this message and this, this, this moment, I couldn't help but think that probably the best way to illustrate this is Singapore itself. Singapore is one of the great nations on the planet today. And when you think about this nation that is a very young nation, in the midst of that youthfulness, it is probably because they found themselves great opportunities, not came with great opportunities, or great opportunities came with great obstacles. The great obstacles really shaped their great opportunities. Think about a moment where you don't have water supply and you don't have, uh, you don't have a currency and you don't have a standing army. In my home, I have this book that I've read many, many years ago, and really just to understand where Singapore was when it was starting to be a nation, and the challenges of the great opportunities come with great obstacles. And think about how Singapore came and built a nation without manuals. There was no manual for an island nation. There was no manual for a, co a country that has no domestic flights that then built an airline that travels the world. There is no manuals for all of these. But because the leaders of the land stayed and because they took that as a sign to write our own manuals, when they took that and say, let's stay the course, I often tell my Singaporean friends, you're a blessed people. To have a government that has been around for the last 52 years that want to serve you, that's a blessing, and you should be grateful for that because that's one of the reasons. Staying the course is an important lesson to learn in faith as well as in day-to-day -day life. We may be in different rooms, as I've said earlier, but we have the same spirit, and that spirit is the spirit to pray. That spirit is the spirit to meditate on the word day and night. And part of the reason why I'm preaching to you and speaking to you and declaring God's word over you is so that you can meditate on that word. Now, there's a third side to being in different spaces, different rooms and different places, but being in the same spirit. And that's the word proclaim. Proclaiming the gospel or being real to what the gospel is and what Jesus did for you is the great differentiator of your faith. In a word, that is known as communion. Communion is Jesus' way of getting us back to the reality that the God of heaven became man to die for us, to pay for our infractions, our corruption, our sin, so that we can have access to God in prayer, that we have access through the Holy Spirit to hear the word, and not just hear it in our ears, but to find that it is living and active and able to change us and build us. Now, the idea of a communion, whilst we're not in the same room, but in the same spirit, is actually a piece of bread and a cup. In fact, if you have a kaya toast and a cup of tea, that would be communion. And you sat down with others and you, you proclaim that Jesus died for you. You take that bread and, and you literally tell people, that, tell each other, this is what our God did for us. And pick up the cup and say that he spilled his blood for us. That's communion. I go even further to say that proclaiming is not just saying the rituals and the words, but the reality of what did God do for you this week? There's a lot I can say this week. The stress, the tension, the guidance, the faith, keeping my wife and I healthy, keeping my five grandchildren healthy, protecting them from the giant firecracker of a volcano in the Philippines, a lot. There's a lot we can say about our God. It's a habit to learn how to pray and be in the Spirit and not, never cease breathing and tapping into the presence of God. It's a habit to know how to meditate on the Word day and night, that our default is whenever we find the problem we face, our habit should be, what does God have to say about it? 
and meditate on that word day and night. And finally, make it a habit to proclaim the gospel. That's why Jesus said, whenever you pick up the bread and pick up the cup, remember me. It's the ecosystem for you to pray and meditate and on what he has done for you and what his word says. If you're Asian like me, you probably eat three, four, five times a day. And so you have no excuse because you pick up the bread and the cup multiple times in the day. And that's why the genius of the words of Jesus are such. It's not just spiritual. It's actually rather very practical. But the final way to express the proclamation of the gospel is how you serve others. The way you proclaim the truth that God has blessed me and that God cares for me and God loves me is how I care for the lost, how I care for other people. And I want to encourage you to continue to fellowship with one another. And I pray that as you go through the week, that you would continue to pray, to meditate, to proclaim, and to fellowship together. And I pray also that you would continue to pray for China, pray for one another, uh, realize that you have great opportunities in front of you despite the great obstacles that you're seeing, that you would uh, get to the place where you understand that you need to be on the ground, not to be in fear, to be in faith, to see things as they are, and in the midst of that, to believe that God is greater than that greatest obstacle. And thirdly, that you have in your hands really the faith to change things around you. So let me close with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for what you're doing. And we acknowledge the promise that we may not want, but a promise that you have so ordained to shake what can be shaken so that what may not be shaken will remain. Teach us, Lord, to respond to that in a way of faith, in a way of knowing that the greatest obstacles we find is where our greatest opportunities lie. And Father, while there may be no manuals for these obstacles and these situations, it's an opportunity for us to be led and guided by you. If we tune ourselves to you in prayer and in your word, and Lord, we just thank you for giving us the grace to stay the course. Let all these be done in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen and Amen. Well, God bless you. Enjoy the rest of your time together.